If you're new to audio, or even if you just need a refresher, this video's for you. I'm gonna show you some simple techniques to ensure you get the best sound possible when recording anything digitally. It's full on nerdy stuff and it's coming right up. So, good day and welcome to the Time Preservation Society. I'm Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell notification so you can be notified of new content right when it drops. And share these videos if you think they're valuable to someone else. Cheers. I don't, I don't know. For this video, we will focus on preamps, bits, sample rates, signal levels, analog, digital, and all you'll need to know to capture sounds digitally, whether for music or for videos and film or for podcasts, voiceover, etc. It's a lot of information, so I'm going to try to power through with less humor than I normally do. This might be a long one, and it's all talky talky. So treat this as a podcast and, uh, I don't know, do something with your hands or something. Okay, let us begin. Digital recording is pretty simple when you get a basic understanding of it. Here's a quick breakdown. Putting aside analog signals and digital conversion, in the digital world, you are working with slices of time inside a few different sizes of cups or containers or a track. I'll explain. First, I'll explain the slices of time. The slices of time are known as sample rates or kilohertz, and this is measured in the amount of slices of a sound per second. Samples. So... 44.1 kilohertz is 44,100 slices or samples of a piece of audio per second. It takes an audio signal and recreates it by separating one second of sound into 44,100 slices of it. This is represented in 44,100 hertz times per second or a shorter way of saying that is 44.1 kilohertz because kilo means times a thousand. So 44,100 hertz divided by 1,000 is 44.1. 44.1 times a thousand is 44,100. Metric. USA. Get on it. Audio CDs are all encoded at a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz. This is the basic standard for digital audio for listening. For video or film audio, the preferred number to record at is 48 kilohertz or 48,000 hertz, as we understand it. The reason is because a film is normally shot in 24 frames per second, and the sound is thus 48 kilohertz per second for an easier digital math. It goes much deeper than that, but I wanted to just say that audio for video is preferably recorded at 48 kilohertz. This video's audio sample rate measures... Oh, hold on a second. Let me just find my trusty old measuring tape here. <laughs> you know... This measuring tape was manufactured in 2004 by a man named Ben Gates. He was great at puzzles and even once stole the Declaration of Independence, if you can believe it. <laughs> but what a great measuring tape. I picked it up that same year in Philadelphia. It measures 48 kilohertz. <clears throat> you can also record in higher quality by going up to 96 kilohertz or even 192 kilohertz which are 96,000 samples of sound per second or 192,000 samples of sound per second, respectively. But this does not result in any real perceivable difference to the human ear. You're not going to be able to tell the difference. I don't care who you are, you're not going to be able to hear a difference. The only reason you would record higher than 48 kilohertz is if you plan on manipulating the audio somehow in post, like slow it down. If you intend on slowing audio down, then recording at a higher kilohertz or sample rate will allow you to slow down the audio without creating artifacts or audible quality loss. It's the same with shooting video or film. You want to shoot at 60 frames per second or even 120 or higher if you intend to slow that down to 24 frames per second to get that smooth slow motion. If you shot it at 24 frames per second and then tried to slow that footage down to make cool slow-mo sequence, it would look all jittery since your brain would detect an obvious lack of frames per second. Same with audio. So 
That's why some recorders or interfaces, or DAWs, offer 96 kHz or 192 kHz recording. Do not choose those numbers unless you intend to slow it down somehow, or if you're running lower-end saturation plugins that don't have oversampling built in for anti-aliasing. But that's a whole other video, so I'll just stick to what I'm doing right now. The end point is higher frequency recording just results in massive files that many computers have a hard time working with. Some computers can't handle high sample rates at all. So stick to 44.1 or 48 kilohertz. Don't go lower than that because that's when you'll hear a quality degradation. You do not ever want to record in MP3 format unless you need an insane amount of audio length and don't care about quality. For example, if you were interviewing someone for like 7 or 100 hours straight and you needed it recorded, MP3 is your friend. It takes up much less space and is at least intelligible when you listen back. But for quality sound of any sort that you intend to show others, you do not ever want to record in MP3. Not ever. Never. Now on to the cup sizes, which are represented in bits. Not the other word you're thinking of. The easiest way for me to explain this is by saying that bits represent the container in which you can record sounds in, the size of a cup that'll hold your sounds before overflowing. A bit rate is dynamic range, if you can understand that. The difference between the quietest sounds to the loudest sounds before clipping or digitally distorting, which sounds really, really bad no matter who you are. So when the cup overflows, we get digital distortion. How loud a sound is, is measured in decibels, or dB for short, because us human beings always need to shorten everything, always. 16-bit recording gives you a dynamic range of 96 decibels. That's not a lot. So to put that into perspective using everyday understanding, a motorcycle engine running is about 90 decibels if you're standing 20 feet away. A Boeing 737 is about 97 decibels if you're standing a nautical mile away. A whisper is about 30 decibels. A hairdryer, blender, power tools are about 90 decibels if you're right next to them. So a cranked guitar amp mic'd up is going to clip your inputs at 16-bit recording. Your cup would be overflowing in a very, very bad sounding way. Now, 24 bits has a dynamic range of 144 decibels. This is actually pretty big. Here's the perspective. Concerts and car horns are about 110 decibels if you're right there. Jet planes during takeoff are about 120 decibels if you're standing right there. Fireworks and gunshots are about 140 decibels if you're standing right there. So none of those things would clip our recordings if we record at 24 bits and had the gain turned way down. Anything louder, and we would have to use limiters, which I'll talk about in another video. 32-bit recording, which is relatively new and only more expensive devices offer, has a dynamic range of, are you ready for this? 32 bits has a dynamic range of 1,528 decibels. The loudest sound in the entire world ever accurately recorded is around 200 decibels, and that was a sound of a volcano eruption, Krakatoa that was heard thousands of miles away and is said to have traveled around the world a few times. If you heard 200 decibels, it would be the last thing you ever heard or did because you'd be deaf and dead. So it's virtually impossible to clip your signal when recording in 32 bits. But we aren't going to go deep into 32 bits because this isn't available to everyone. So I just want to give you an idea of what it is so you understand it. Let's now stick to 16 to 24 bits, the usual. So if you've got a choice between 16 and 24 bits in most common interfaces and recorders, always choose 24 bits. Always. A CD, as we've learned earlier, has a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, but it also has only 16 bits of audio. 16 bits does not have a lot of dynamic range, as we've learned, so how can a CD get away with it when we struggle with it when we're recording? Well, that has a lot to do with the post-production. It has everything to do with post-production. 
Once the sound is recorded in 24 bits, the mixing and producing stage comes in. This is where you'll use compressors and clip gain and limiters to squash your sounds into that little 16-bit cup. Because you no longer need the dynamic range. It's all been recorded. It's expected. You know what you're dealing with before it happens. Now you can mix the recorded volumes up and down to fit the smallest cup. You'll no longer have to worry about unexpected spikes or inaudible sounds or any of that. You know exactly what you're working with and can easily take those clean recordings and keep them all level. And then it'll fit in 16 bits. Ah, levels. Now we're going to talk about that. I came from the analog world. Uh, I was doing my high school co-op in a recording studio in the very early 90s on a giant Ampex reel-to-reel machine. Back then, you wanted to get your audio signal as close to zero dB on the VU meter as possible to minimize equipment noise and maximize signal. VU stands for volume units in the analog world. But in the digital world, getting close to zero on the dB meter means certain death to your good sounds. The second any sound peaks just even a little bit over zero on a digital meter, that sound is turned into a gnarly, horrifying, ear-piercing, razor-sharp distortion that sounds so bad. So you can't get close to zero unless you know exactly what you're dealing with. And the only way to know exactly what you're dealing with is having this sound already pre-recorded and processed so that you can expect the unexpected. So for a raw, live, and unpredictable signal, you want to keep it low. This is sometimes called gain staging. You want to keep your gains relatively equal throughout all your digital processing. But for this intro to digital recording video, I'm not going to talk about processing, only just the main gain stage, which is the initial input gain. There are some numbers that are good to know. Here they are. Ideally, you want to capture audio at minus 12 dB with the occasional spikes going no higher than minus 6, and that's pushing it. Those are your ideal numbers. Minus 18 with the occasional spikes of minus 12 is very safe, but a little less ideal, but it's acceptable. This gives you a lot of headroom to play with. And as long as your input signal never goes over 0 dB, then you've preserved the sounds and can then raise it up in your DAW to hotter levels based on need. If the volume in your headphones are too low while you're recording with these levels, uh, then just crank up the headphone amp uh, to compensate for now. Unlike the analog world, we don't need to really worry too much about noise when gain staging. So getting as close to, as you can to zero when recording digitally is entirely unneeded and is way too much of a risk. Like, uh, like deciding to hold your bladder until after your commute to another location. Even if it pays off, it never pays off. You know what I mean? Back in the analog days, sometimes we would push the needle way over zero to get some sweet analog distortion where it would sound appealing. This is not the case in the digital world unless you're using analog emulation plugins designed for this. And it took me years to break that habit. I would, I would always record hotter than I should when I went to digital. And uh, I still do it once in a while when I'm not thinking, just because you're so used to trying to keep that signal as close to zero so you've got the signal-to-noise ratio averted, you know? Digital audio recording is all about capturing the source as efficient and as lossless as possible so that we can shape our sounds how we want them later. There are plenty of ways of doing this, and it's all done differently depending on what you're recording and what you're recording into. So... This part is all about the right tools for the right job. We've already covered microphone selection, which I did an entire other video about, which you can watch right here, if you haven't already. So uh, now on to the capture devices. For general field recording and dialogue captures and stuff like that, you want to make sure you're capturing as cleanly as possible. You don't normally want colorful preamps. You want transparent preamps. <laughs> it's funny the words we use to describe sound visually. I'll explain the visual words by using other visual words. Color is tonal characteristics that are not present in person when you're hearing the source with your own ears. So if you have an analog tube or transistor preamp that imparts color onto your recording, like a, 
like a Neve or an Avalon, it adds grit and punch and saturation harmonics that are pleasing to listen to, but are not necessarily what you'd be hearing when you're listening with your actual physical ears in the real world. Harmonics are sympathetic overtones that are sometimes created over the audible spectrum. On a guitar, lightly placing your finger over the 12th fret will give you the harmonics of the open strummed regular sound. You get the harmonics there, you know what I'm talking about, if you're a guitar player. Harmonics happen in tubes as well, and transistors, when a sound occurs at, say, 110 hertz, which is the A note. Sympathetic ghost notes can also happen at 220, 330, 440, and so on, and it can be very pleasing to listen to. These are octaves. So this is preferable in music recording, making something better sounding or making something become almost 3D in the way it sounds. It adds weight and dimension, mass, see? <laughs> All visually understood terms for audio. So for music, you want the color. You want the Neve or the Avalon or the Manly preamps. You want that grit and punch and subtle harmonics that can happen when analog is driven harder. It gives a rich and pleasing sound that we've all come to expect when we hear our favorite songs, even when we don't know why we like that sound. Transparent audio is when you have no color characteristics added to the audio at all and instead have a clean and pure representation of what you're capturing as if you were right there listening with your own ears. It would be captured just as it's heard. This would be preferred for field recording or location sound on movie sets, on videos with dialogue like this one right now, or some sound effects or Foley. Color can be added later with saturation plugins if it feels right. But if you're doing voiceover, sometimes you want a little color to give lift to your performances. While I have done my share of voiceover work, I'm not a regularly hired professional voiceover artist. If you want to know the best kinds of preamps and interfaces and recorders and color and even microphones for voiceover work, check out The Microphone Assassin here on YouTube. I'll put the link to his channel in the description below and you can see it there. Great channel with great information. His name is Mark Yoshimoto Nemkov, and he's awesome at what he does. So go check him out. So choosing a recorder or computer audio interface that is neutral is best for sounds that need to be precisely recorded as is. So think sound devices or even Zoom recorders or um, RME or universal audio interfaces without preamp emulations loaded in there, of course. Or even Focusrite Scarlets are great picks for recording sounds as they exist. Cold, precise, accurate, clean, real. All recording devices have preamps inside. A preamp takes a very low voltage analog signal like sound from a microphone and amps it up to line levels so that it can be converted at the appropriate levels to a digital signal. And not all preamps are created equally. Not all analog to digital converters are created equally either. There are many bad ones and many good ones. Most consumer grade audio interfaces today are generally pretty good at preamping a signal and then converting the signal to digital. There are a few bad ones, but they are usually cheap in price and pretty easily identified. Most field recorders are decent as well, but there are some bad ones. A great example of bad preamps and bad analog to digital recorders are cameras. Ah yes, not many people think about those. Generally speaking, even great cameras tend to have the worst audio ever, even when they have dedicated analog inputs. Unless the camera has a digital audio input, then it is tasked with taking an analog signal, preamping it, and then converting that analog signal to digital. Camera companies that make consumer level products aren't very concerned about loading their products with great preamps and AD converters. This is where they cheap out. So most of these cameras will have a, a mic input, a small 3.5 millimeter jack that is 100% analog. It expects a mic level signal and then it preamps the signal into a line level internally and then converts it to digital and adds it to the video. And it does this with notably bad quality. So even if you have a wicked expensive mic 
a really nice sounding sound devices recorder with cashmere preamps and world-class analog to digital conversion. And then you send an analog line out to your camera. What you're doing actually is preamping a mic in the sound devices recorder, then converting that to a digital signal. So far, so good. Then converting that digital signal back to analog. Okay. And then sending the analog signal out to your camera using a 3.5 millimeter headphone cable where your camera then reamps the signal. Oh boy. And then reconverts it to digital and adds it to the video. Yuck. The result is a very bad sound, or at least a hell of a lot worse than what you're getting in your recorder. There are many reasons for this. One is that the mic input in your camera is looking for a mic level signal and not a line level signal. So it will try to preamp an already preamped and hot signal. Digital distortion city. Another reason is because most consumer level cameras record in 16 bit audio. Not all of them, but a lot of them in the lower end at least for sure, leaving very little headroom for dynamics like we talked about earlier. Another reason is that Cameras have shardy preamps and analog to digital conversion, and it's quite noticeable, at least to me it is. Since the sounds that come out of our mouths or from our instruments or from the world at large are not ones and zeros, but rather sound waves, we need to convert those sound waves to ones and zeros, and that's when quality analog to digital conversion is important. So when making a video or a film, the ideal way of capturing the sound is separately. Sure, it's fine to take a line off the recorder and into the camera, but only so you can better match it with the recorder audio in post. The pros use time code to sync audio and video in post, and that's how they do it. But once again, the camera isn't recording the audio, the audio recorder is. So you're getting the maximum amount of beautiful sound that you can preserved right there in the source. The very first analog, first digital conversion, right to, to record it to disc, SD card, whatever. For music recording, you want color and vibe and personality when you can get it. So this is why people use saturation plugins in their DAWs, DAWs, uh, if their interfaces are too accurate sounding. Because you don't want accurate when you're recording music. You want feeling, you know? Many pros use outboard gear to preamp the mics and then go into interfaces to be converted to ones and zeros. It captures that vibe and saturation and harmonics, like I said before, before being converted to digital. If you don't have outboard gear, digital emulations of outboard gear are the next best thing. And there are many plugins that do that, available by many plugin makers. We can do another video about that at another time. Actually, I'm working on a whole Universal Audio set of videos for that. For general field recording like Foley, uh, sound effects or ambiences, etc., you will want pure, clean, and accurate sound with low noise preamps. That's what you'd want. For post work, the work that we do to the audio after we've recorded it, we can talk about DAW choices, but I'll do another video on that at another time. This is getting way too long, and that's a whole video by itself. So that's it. We finally got to the end of the video, podcast, whatever you want to call it now, because you were just listening anyway. We uh, covered bits and sample rates and levels and preamps and converters and where to use what. So to sum up, here is the TLDR elevator pitch. Always record at 24 bits if you can help it. Never record lower than 44.1 kilohertz in your sample rate. Never record as an MP3 unless you're not going for quality and instead need quantity. Record at 48 kilohertz when doing film or video. Set all digital recording gain levels to peak no higher than minus six dB with an average of minus 12 dB. Never record audio into your camera if you can help it. Choose transparent recording for dialogue, field recording, etc. And choose color or saturation for music and artsy fartsy things. So there you have it. Thanks for sticking around and learning with me. Oh, and it's possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not weakness. That is life. 
Bye now. And transmission. And you can watch those other videos. It will really help my time. I'm like right on the cusp. You know that? Right on the cusp of actually getting paid to do these videos. That would be good. I'll make like 47 cents, I think, a month. Either way, it's a lot of fun. Thanks for sticking around this long. Bye, guys.